I'm Patrick Pacheco. Coming up on Theatre, All the Moving Parts, I talk with the brilliant architect and set designer, David Rockwell. Hello, and welcome to Theatre, All the Moving Parts. I'm your host, Patrick Pacheco at Shea Josephine on Manhattan's Theatre Row, directing the spotlight to those artists whose commitment is as inspiring as it is profound. The artistry of today's guest, David Rockwell, covers a vast landscape. As an architect, David has designed museums, airport terminals, hospitals, playgrounds, and, oh, by the way, he's the collaborating architect on that half-billion-dollar, 200,000-square-foot, New York Art Center called The Shed. But David's favorite playground is the theater, and he's poured his heart into designing sets for such shows as Hairspray, Kinky Boots, The Normal Heart, Kiss Me Kate, and Tootsie. Welcome, David, to theater, all the moving parts, and you are a man that never stops moving. What's amazing about you, both as an architect and as a set designer, is the centuries-old permanence of architecture and the fleeting impermanence of theater. Was it the ability to, to create these deep and profound moments in the theater that are the things that last, that drew you to the theater? Nice to be here. <laughs> I think what I remember, um, sort of the sense memory of really powerful experiences as a kid um, come from the theater. Mm -hmm. And they come from being part of the theater at the community theater level and um, going to the theater um, as, a young, as a young kid with my family. And what compelled me about it was the sense of um, sort of instant community and the idea that there was um, this connection. And I found that very powerful growing up, that a sleepy little suburb in the summer everyone wanted to play together and, and collaborate. When, we, when I was 12, we moved to, to Mexico, and that really morphed into, very naturally, a love of public spaces. And you know, as opposed to the Jersey Shore, that was really life centered around these great public theaters. The marketplace was mm -hmm. as theatrical as anything uh, you'll see at a, at a festival. But I think my drive as a designer um, is finding ways design connects people. Um, and, and for me, that was both a career and um, a way of navigating the world that I found life-giving and, and, um, and endlessly fascinating. How, as a set designer, are you best able to collaborate with your partners, uh, creative partners, in order to create those connections, in order to create those moments? Every project I do, I start out with lots of research. Mm -hmm. um, I think research is critically important. And of course, that research in some ways has to precede the project. You bring your life interests and, and um, what you see in the world and um, sort of looking out at things that inspire you. Then I uh, read the piece and um, try and find what is the sort of physical language that is going to tell that story and how does that physical language want to change from the beginning to the end? Can you find an arc? Can you find an emotional uh, journey that um, can be physicalized in a way that is um, helpful to the audience and helpful to the performers? Then, you know, you really have to be given permission to play with the director and with the team to try different things. and. Um, uh, so we, we actually create these big image boards that um, will look at ideas around the central idea, will pursue a lot of tangents that end up not being the way you go, uh -huh. uh, being willing to make suggestions where the director will go, really? <laughs> uh, but I think that freedom um, allows us to invent a world that will really support that story and, uh, you know, in the case of the musical, you're listening to the language of the music. Um, a very common phrase is, don't put a hat on a hat, uh -huh. which is something I thought a lot about in, um, in Kiss Me Kate. Because when we did all this research, we saw these beautiful backstage worlds 
which Scott Ellis loved and Warren Carlyle and loved. Your choreographer. Our choreographer. And we realized we had to go from that to the world of the taming of the shrew that would support comedy. Mm -hmm. So what was romantic and yearning didn't provide the comedy. So it was a, a matter of finding those worlds and how those connected. So you're always looking for that final missing element that the set won't duplicate anything else, but will really bring it together. What I find fascinating about the way that you work is that you have always said, I don't like to start knowing the answers, that what I do is an exploration of what those potential answers are. So when you are talking in the early stages to a director like Scott Ellis, are you doodling? Are you a doodler? I'm a doodler and a, and a paper folder. <laughs> so I, you know, I find sketching brings a director in. And then we start with very rough models because so much of theater is uh, spatial uh -huh. and sequencing. So there's kind of what the visual vocabulary is, and then there is determining how that's going to move and how that movement um, invites the audience in. It's, it really is the ultimate thrill as a theater designer to be sitting in the theater, and when those transitions happen, you realize it's 20 people were involved in that transition from the people doing the automation, lighting, sound, and the audience just perceives, you know, this emotional lift. Um, Boris Aronson's model for Fiddler on the Roof. I know that was a seminal experience for you, going back to Deal, New Jersey, that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. When was the first time that you saw his work? And I know you collect his work. What kind of seminal influence was he on you? Well, it was Fiddler on the Roof when I was 12. Uh -huh. I, I recently um, was at an event where Sheldon Harnick asked me to give him an award. Uh -huh. I was the fourth person to get up to speak about him. And by the time I got up, everyone had mentioned Fiddler on the Roof. And I just thought, oh my god, I've got to find a different entry point. But it was the, the project that first got my attention of his work. And then I got to know Lisa Aronson, widow, his granddaughter? widow, widow. widow who was right. also his assistant El Mel and Mel Siner's assistant before. Wow. So I started to collect his work. And, and what was so interesting is, think about those transitions in Fiddler. Mm -hmm. And you can't hear those songs without imagining some of those moves. Now, in Joel Gray's beautiful Yiddish production, it doesn't have the physical world, mm -hmm. but it still has the movement that was defined by Jerome Robbins and, and uh, Boris Aronson. This is the Yiddish fiddler on the roof that yeah. is on 42nd Street, very near here, actually. Very beautiful. Which is very, very moving. By the time that you saw uh, your mother took you to uh, see Fiddler on the Roof, I think, when you were 12, yep. uh, at the Majestic. Yep. Um, by the time you saw it, your father... Herschel Bernardi, I, w I got the second. <laughs> you did get zero, must tell, telling uh, box scores or, or baseball yep. scores yep. during intermission. Um, by that time, your father had died in a plane crash, I believe, at the age of two. Your yep. mother would die later. I would think that these so sort of traumatic events gave you an emotional way into the impermanence of life, a sense of mortality that then made creating these uh, moments all the more important. Well, you know, now in the rear view mirror, mm -hmm. I can connect dots that you can't connect when you're doing it. So what I knew was design was a way I felt I could connect with people to create these um, incredible moments. And, and certainly I was driven, I think, to think about that by um, losses and transitions in my life, lots of moving around. I think with theater, and the truth is with architecture, my early work in architecture, which started out in restaurants, was all about creating places to have these incredible moments and memories. Mexico was a fascinating place to begin to learn that mm -hmm. because Mexico was so much about um, events and festivals, and uh, um, I was mind boggled by um, that. And in fact, in, in 2008, did a research book called Spectacle yeah. that really questioned in a world in which we're all connected virtually, what is the drive to creating these live moments that create memories that last long after the event? And so that interest in event and theater for the first 15 years of my work as an architect in New York was brought into the architecture. And then as I started to think about working in the theater, which was a 
five-year process of meeting every director and talking and sketching, uh -huh. as, as you suggested, and f sort of finding the right opportunity, um, I was able to uh, to realize how incredibly important that was to me as a as an inspiration. And and now working in the theater, you realize some of my strongest memories are these moments that I've seen in the theater, and now I get to be part of crafting those. So it's indescribably wonderful to come full circle and, and be able to do that. What you were describing earlier uh, with uh, Kiss Me Kate was what you described in uh, Through Fiddler as the physical engine yeah. uh, of it. Explain a little bit about what you mean by the physical engine and how the set designer is crucial to that motor that drives I, these I, emotional moments. That I believe about. the first time I, I heard that saying was Hal Prince. Mm -hmm. I think he's written about it, and, and it's certainly something I've thought a lot about, but I believe that's where I first had the notion of the engine that drives the show. What you can do in theater is go from place to place right in front of the audience. You're, you know, the designer is really, along with the director, the cinematographer mm -hmm. in affecting where the audience can, can look. And um, I find uh, movement when set to music, and I think about um, in Hairspray, at the end of Welcome to the 60s, for those who remember that coming out of Seattle, right. we all knew we wanted to up that. So Mark and Scott wrote a reprise, and during that reprise, every piece of scenery irised and disappeared in that music, and you know that's seared in my memory. And in Kiss Me Kate, one of the things I was intrigued by is it's a, it's a, a love of backstage. We start out in this very simple world of backstage, and I knew from the beginning Scott felt there was something about bookending that, mm -hmm. which was not written in the play. It was something he wanted to sort of adapt and, and work with Paul, Jim, and Johnny to figure it out musically. And then we got to having the set sort of dematerialize as that backstage world comes back. And it's very moving. It's an emotional back end. It's, it, there's something nostalgic uh, about it and a little and touching as well. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and uh, one of the, the moments, just in terms of how things move, Studio 54 is a very compressed space. Uh -huh. And I always believe limitations force interesting solutions. So since it's not very deep and there's no wing space, the uh, backstage world uh, the, uh, which is three separate pieces, can flatten and go against the back wall or come all the way downstage. Towards the end of the show, when Fred sings a reprise of So In Love, the entire set, as he's singing it, moves as far as it can upstage, just imperceptibly, so it, the audience almost feels like it may be a slow camera dolly uh -huh. as that goes back and then he walks into the walks up the stair. And you also have a moment uh, with the drop in, uh, we open in Venice, yeah. where the clouds actually dance, right? You have this, how did that moment, which is very witty, uh, materialize? It came about when we started to think about what's the world of the show with the show going to be. So I started to look for inspiration, and I didn't want one generic unit set for all the Taming of the Shrew numbers. I felt like that's not what Fra Fred Graham would have conceived mm -hmm. of. And Who's the uh, director within the show. Right. right. So when you look at the show, every scene of the show within the show is dominated by a color idea. Mm -hmm. That's dominated by the kind of red, amber flowers and then the, the hills of wheat in the distance and these clouds. I knew from my knowledge has shown, speaking to Scott, that we wanted to introduce, that's the first moment where they're, they're performing, and we wanted that to be vivid and very different. So by having a wood truss with these hemp lines that support these clouds, it really invites the cast. And it's so interesting that the first time the cast did that, uh -huh. they were excited by it. So the clouds come up, uh, I suppose we should probably explain, so and we get the names of the cities that they're singing about. We do, and we get to see them go faster and faster <laughs> yes. and faster. As and, our... and, and the clouds are keeping time with it. Yeah. So in effect, your, your set is basically dancing uh, along with Warren Carlyle's uh, choreography no, as well. No tap, but it does dance. <laughs> but it does and dance. you know, Warren is such a delight. He, it, it's funny how if you give a director and choreographer those tools, they'll really play with you. Uh -huh. So originally, uh, Kelly O'Hare was pulling the ropes, uh -huh. and we realized we didn't want her upstage, and so that allowed them to be downstage and have someone 
pulling those. You mentioned your color palette for the sets for Kiss Me Kate earlier. Were they inspired by paintings perhaps that you saw of 16th century Venice? Well, we looked at lots of uh, ways to approach that. We actually drew it from late 40s animation. <laughs> so the, the, the key was trying to find a color world that felt a little bit more vivid uh. and a little bit less um, specifically nostalgic in that way. It sounds like what you do with research is that you do research and then you sort of put it aside and you sort of develop what is needed for the heightened reality of theater. Well, also, you never know where research is going to take you. So when I say I don't want a project where I know the answer beforehand, that little bit of terror, uh -huh. like in the, case of, in the case of Tootsie, I'm going to create a musical that celebrates New York. Uh -huh. Well, you know, West Side Story, company on the town, guys and dolls. There's an amazing legacy of musicals that did that. So there's a little bit of terror about what's the way we're going to do that that suits this show. And, and that led to research in, in lots of unexpected ways. <laughs> terror is a good way to put it. And I think people don't really realize just the kind of terror that artists have to come through. But speaking of Tootsie, you go from an Art Deco cityscape backdrop, from a park bench to a subway, to Michael's apartment, to a 42nd Street rehearsal room, to a restaurant. To In a the first three scenes. <laughs> <laughs> and to a theater. That really moves and dances. Did you find that you had to be a choreographer to make all these movements to uh, coordinate with the engine of this particular show? But my mom was a choreographer. Tell us the name of your mom. Joanne, which was the name of Scott Ellis's mom too, coincidentally. Really? Yeah. She was a choreographer, and if you look at our recent work architecturally, Union Square Cafe, Danny Meyer likes to say, is as choreographed as any, any show. Yeah. So I think movement is an impulse that drives our interaction with buildings. In the case of Tootsie, it had some very unique demands that, that I haven't dealt with before, and one of them was it is really a big comedy inside a big musical. And so the second act is lots of really funny long book scenes that want a downstage apartment that looks like Michael's apartment, which is in a fragment. It's not a moment, it's a real world. So we had to develop a version of New York, which I'm very excited about. Um, I think the way New York is represented is unique and, um, and the way Don Holder's lighting it is beautiful. But the city can part and then this apartment can come up and down stage in a way that really changes the dynamic from musical to comedy. How difficult was it for you to learn, if you had to at all, just how much the audience could fill in if you gave them a fragment? Well, every director has a different opinion about that. <laughs> and so part of it is learning the rhythm of the director. And um, you do want the audience to do some work. I remember once speaking to George Wolf, watching him directing A Lucky Guy. Right, which you it, designed, obviously. Which I designed, and which was really very fragmentary because it was dealing with a number of newsrooms. But I saw him talking to actors about the difference between sort of leaning forward or leaning back, and I think sets can do the same thing. Uh -huh. So I think there's moments in Tootsie where it leans back, and there's moments where it leans forward. At the end of the first act, Michael has this fantasy number where he imagines he's the greatest star ever, male or female, and the set, <laughs> and the set helps him with that celebration, ending with a, a kind of moment you'd, you'd hope would end a first act where the audience goes, what's going to happen next? You brought up something, um, uh, or you have a term that I've not heard of in connection with uh, set design, and that is backstory. Can you yep. explain a little bit about what you mean by backstory in a set? I, I think Backstory helps in any form of design develop a point of view where decisions aren't arbitrary. So, you know, I learned that early on in, in, in architecture that I wanted a kind of logic of uh, why something is the way it is. And one way to evolve that is think about, in the case of Tootsie, the New York skyline wants to fill that need of sort of heroic New York skyline. But also I think the backstory of Michael and what he's willing to do to become a star uh -huh. and what that journey is 
allowed us to think about watercolors. And early on in research, we looked at these very soft, beautiful watercolors and from a backstory point of view, said, well, how does that blend with the sort of harder-edged, heroic view of New York? Uh -huh. And that led us to the solution. Backstory also means constructing um, what happened before that moment so you can start to uh, have an attitude other than I like blue or I like red, um, that, it, that it sort of naturally leads to a, a decision. With the Helen Hayes, that backstory became not only... Which the, you renovated, obviously. Which had uh, been many different things from, from early on from 1912, where it had a balcony, and it had survived all of these changes. And by looking at what had been there before, we could come up with an approach of what it could be now that wasn't a simple one-line slavish reproduction. So the way we could find authenticity wasn't by mimicking something, it was by generating that point of view. One of the things that you mentioned in terms of, of that backstory is technology versus handcraft. I mean, there were what, how many handmade models were in your set, your Tony winning set for She Loves Me? And also the back of... And there's, yeah. there's two of them on the set of Kiss Me Kate, since that was lucky we put them on, her, on <laughs> in the okay. dressing. There are times when actors have to move the sets, and sometimes technology obviously does it. What goes into the decision when you or the director say, we're going to have actors moving? I think technology is inherently not interesting on its own, and, mm -hmm. and theater has always been a laboratory and a testing ground for adopting technology from other areas. Robotic lighting, uh, all of the LED lighting, um, automation are things that were sort of developed in other industries and, and then tested and co-opted in the theater. And any transition requires technology if it's going to involve automation, but it also requires all of the humans driving that. Mm -hmm. I think um, the reason it's, it's good to have a distinct point of view about those two is technology locks you into a number of patterns, and if you can be sure that that's what you're going to want it to do, you could build that in. But if you want to have a freer set of decisions, um, for when we go in and out of the new 42, Right. in Tootsie, which for anyone who's rehearsed a show will recognize the sign. The, the actors bring that in because the action of that is really what would happen in that scenario. So I think you want to have the things that can be actor driven. You need to make sure the director and choreographer have the people to do that. The history of, of architecture, like the history of Broadway, is a story of responding to what the city needs at any given time and place. What does the city need that the shed may be the answer to? Well, the, the shed is a, a project where we've been a part of it since 2010. Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro are the mm -hmm. lead architects. We've had the privilege of collaborating over 10 years throughout a period of time in which it began as a request from the city for a cultural piece that would anchor Hudson Yards and really began with a series of ideas that Diller, Scafidio, Renfro, and Rockwell put forward that in 2008, which as you remember was economically a sort right. of disaster, right. the city had begun thinking about what kinds of um, things might be interesting to have culturally there. They went out to speak to existing cultural institutions to see if they wanted to link to it. And the decision was to create this ground up art center with Alex Poots coming on board as the sort of creative lead that is really based on the idea of we don't know what artists are going to want to use in the future, so let's create a nimble, um, flexible set of conditions that starts to think about how many different artists can use a space, almost like an urban festival, and, and, and the flexibility is um, has been the key driver. And, I think it's almost like it can dance. This massive thing can dance. It can dance, but it can also step out of the way and let uh -huh. the performers do the dancing. And, and I think that um, when you think about theaters as memory machines, uh -huh. 
I think the most iconic thing about the shed will ultimately be what happens within it. One of the fascinating things, we have to wrap up, David, but I know that in your uh, four stories of, of, uh, of at, the, at the Rockwell Group, you yeah. have a music room. I do. And with somebody that is busy as you are, you take a break and can compose yourself in your music room uh, and play the piano. What are you working on now? <laughs> the piano. I'm working on. Um, and Beethoven. you're being taught by, uh, I mean, we should say, sort of a, a master, a 90 year old master, Seymour Bernstein. Is that correct? Yeah, and so I went to see Seymour to say I'd like to study with him, and he heard me play and he put his arm around me and he said, Well, you can play a little piano, but if you want to learn to make music, you really need to commit. Um, and I've been so inspired by him, so uh, I did put a music room in the office because there's half an hour here, half an hour there, or two hours in the morning if I get in at 6.30, um, where I'm able to delve down and, and um, get into a level of uh, sort of inspiration and artistry that just takes me to a whole other place. And I'm working on Beethoven's Patatique, uh, well. <laughs> which could be a lifetime, a lifetime uh, adventure. Well, you've had a lifetime, a couple of lifetime adventures, but uh, thank you so much for joining us, and I wish you luck on all your projects. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. Your time. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back next month with another look at the brave, bold, and singular artists who live and work only to astonish us.